We once made a program in um, in Manchester, and during the rehearsal, at least the, the dress rehearsal, which is the full run, I told a story, and I kept at it, and the cameramen were crying, stifling their laughter. And what they'd done, somebody put cotton around Hamble's neck, and as I told the story, her body just inched <laughs> up the set, it's been hung. Here's a house, here's a door. Windows, one, two, three, four. Ready to knock, turn the lock, play school. I think there was always that adrenaline pumping and, and the, the countdown, the last ten seconds. Six. And uh, there was fear there, but I'm sure that produces a spark of something. They used to say that children of several days old would start to recognise the play school music or the music going into the windows. Children apparently used to say, their mother would come into the room and say, oh, it's still on, they go, shh, go away, this is mine, this is my programme. Play School came to BBC Two in 1964 and was the very first programme on the network. Thanks to a power strike, it snatched the moment of glory from the light entertainment department. The programme was destined to run for 24 years, to become forever ingrained in people's imaginations and to change preschool television forever. Play School presenter Brian Kent was there from the very beginning and he recalls his first audition. Joy Whitby was the lady who masterminded Play School and she kicked a box out from under her table and said, get in that box. <laughs> I said, pardon, she said, get in the box and row out to sea. So I sort of sat on the filling, quite an idiot, sitting on the floor in an, in an office. But um, I gathered myself together and I rode out to sea and I remember I fished up a, a boot full of custard and it was very calm out there, it was very pleasant actually, there, no waves or anything and I, I just chanted about in this box for a while and then went back into shore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she thought, eventually got the job. <laughs> well, she realised she got an idiot on her hands who would do almost anything they asked. I think that's why I was in. Now, there are some very interesting actions to go with this song, you see. Like um, pointing up for high, flapping for a fly, and a bird making a nest with your arms. I'll tell you it all as we go along. Are you ready? Here we go. How high point up does a fly fly flap flap when a fly flaps ever so high point up again. We know a bird more flapping flies to its nest, make a nest with your arms, never cold, hold your nose, flies to your chest, bang it. We always oh, heard we know where the flies flap go when the wintry hug yourself for wintry weather is nigh. But how high point does a fly fly flapping when a fly flies ever so high? We got that. Here we go. Have another try. How high does you did a doctor. Hello. Especially when you are new to television, my name's Johnny Ball. This is the tale of a donkey, and the tale of a donkey's tail. <coughs> I remember doing the first week, and I knew I'd been pretty awful. And they wouldn't edit in those days, because they only had one tape, and to cut a tape was 50 pounds on the budget to cut the tape. So they rehearsed, and then recorded as live, and hopefully it went out live. They didn't have to doctor it at all. And I caused a retake every show, you see. And I was in the pub across the road after the five days, absolutely exhausted. And I said to the floor manager, how was I really? He said, over the whole week. I said, yeah. He said, well, to be honest, John, you were bloody diabolical. He said. But Johnny was quick to appreciate that the skills of a play school presenter went beyond remembering lines and getting it right first time. Somebody once said, just imagine you're talking to one person, a kid, perhaps in Liverpool, with the arse at him hanging out of his trousers, whose mum has gone out that door and he doesn't know when she'll be back. There's no food in the house, there's no heating. There's only the television in the corner. And he's stuck there on his own, and he's five. Think of that child. Talk to that child. And once I got that, that changed, you see, and suddenly I started to think the right way about it. This direct approach was completely new to children's programmes and made a big impact, according to Anne Gobi, who worked on the production team of the first ever play school. Well, at that stage in 1964, there hadn't been a programme where adults talked to a child or anyone talked to a child. It had more been puppets. And it was a really a revolutionary programme in, in, in its thinking. It was there to encourage the child to participate in all kinds of ways, to educate through play. You know, there was no pressure for the child to learn, but through the play and the 
experience they had of watching the programme, it intensified their curiosity, I suppose. Hello, Don. Hello, Fun. Hello, you two. You OK? Hello, Brian. Brian. How are you, Johnny? Hello. Nice to see you, Brian. Lucy as well. Hello. How are you? I'm oh, good, thanks. Hey, you look well. Hello. How are you? How do you feel today? The programme was always presented by two presenters at a at a time yes. was there anyone you particularly enjoyed working with i certainly used to like working with uh, chloe ashcroft who had a certain extreme quality that a lot of other people didn't have and julie stevens who was a hoot i mean she was just mad i'm walking through a great big muddy puddle <coughs> do you want to walk through a muddy puddle with me come on she talked the hind leg off a donkey and <laughs> We don't need to just get the recording done. Nothing worried me. I mean, like this. can you do this? Oh, yes, yes. Can you tell a story? Yes. Can you sing a song? La, 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 la. So it was, uh, and they, they saw this and thought, well, you know, they can use this. Brian Kant, Julie Stevens and Johnny Ball made up part of a rotating team of presenters, which also included Derek Griffiths, Lionel Morton, Eric Thompson, Flora Benjamin, Carol Schell, to name but a few. They all came from different backgrounds, teaching, acting and performing and had to work with whoever they were paired with by the producers. Some combinations got on particularly well, as Fred Harris remembers. I have to admit that on occasion I did attempt to um, make Carol Chell laugh on the take. There was one occasion where I was being the milkman, and she said, Oh, uh, a pint of milk and a carton of yoghurt, please. Now, at rehearsals, I'd say it a different flavour every time. I said, oh, well, we've got lemon or we've got, uh, we've got tangerine flavour. On the take, I thought, oh, what the hell? I said, we've got two new flavours today, madam. We've got cheese and onion or liver and bacon. Thinking that there would be a smirk from her. And with a totally straight face, she said, mmm, I think liver and bacon sounds nice. At which point she looked at camera and gave a twinkle in her eye as if to say to the kid, isn't Fred being stupid? Woodpecker was a very noisy woodpecker. All woodpeckers love pecking at tree trunks, but this woodpecker never wanted to stop. I think the men find it more difficult than the women, actually, to, to roll around the floor and say, I'm a caterpillar. Um, I think they, they had to learn how to do that without feeling completely stupid. Because, of course, the cameraman rehearsals used to fall about. Beep, beep. Went the car... Went the cow. Went the sheep. We had a lot of fun at rehearsal because the toys were always getting thrown around and drop kicked and things like that. <laughs> yeah. they, well, they would never sit up, would they? You know, I mean, Jemima wouldn't sit up. Hamble was a menace because she looked so horrible. Humpty and uh, little Ted, I used to get on with quite well. We used to go out to lunch together and things like that. Can I help you with uh, the toys? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Big Ted, if you'd like to sit there, you'll find you're very comfortable. And uh, Miss Hamble, if you'd like to sit here, do try and sit up. They did have personalities. I mean, Humpty was a bit sort of rumbustious and uh, would, would kind of get things wrong. Um, Jemima was an um, empty-headed bimbet, really, I think. You know, she had long legs, but I think that was why she was there. Big Ted was a bit sort of stodgy. There was another close shave as well, um... Big Ted, what happened to him? You're talking about the time he was stolen. Mm. Well, I mean, of course, the one who's now in the Bradford Museum of Photography, Television and uh, Film and Arts isn't the real Big Ted. We went to lunch one day, uh, leaving all the toys and all the props where they were, and there's usually somebody patrolling. But when we came back from lunch, Big Ted had been stolen. And uh, lovely Eric Morecambe often used to, because they used to record in the studio next to us, he often used to pay a little visit and have a word with the toys and see how they were. And he walked in and had to tell him that uh, Big Ted had been stolen. Nobody liked Hamble, to be honest. There was only, we were stuck with Hamble, and there was only one Hamble in existence, and it came from Woolworths. And apparently there were thousands of these at one time. But Hamble was the only one left. And every time anything went wrong with her, as indeed it did, because people used to kick around the studio because everybody hated her. Her head would fall off and she'd have to be sent to the doll's hospital. We were always stuck because we didn't have an, a, a handle. But there was some woman who I think was up in Chester or somewhere who had the only other handle in existence. And she, she wouldn't sell it to the Beeb. She would hire it at 40 quid a week whenever handle needed repairing. 
Maybe it was the atmosphere created by the presenters in the studio, or certain toys that were fast making the programme a big success. Or maybe it was the constant daily guessing game. Through one of the windows today, you can see Brian and Miranda on a farm. They spent the whole day there. And it's going to be through the... Did you rotate the windows, or did the round window feature more often? Maggie, did you never work out how it worked? It was so simple. If the theme of the day was about, uh, let's say, wheels, it would be the round window. If it's about cardboard boxes, it's the square window. The arch window didn't feature very often. No, it didn't. It no, didn't. well, you had to have fountains, or you had to some have something arch-shaped. Um, but anyway, that would have to be the theme of the day. So it was very, very obvious, really, if you, if you think about it. And it accounts for the fact why I was constantly frustrated, because I wanted you to go through the arched window. And, as I say, I always remember it being the round window. Mm, well, there are more round things in this world than there are arched things, I'm afraid. That was, it was as simple as that. And it's going to be through the... My children, let me tell you, actually used to capitalise on the fact that I did play school. There was a great... Um, great kudos to being able to say to the, the, the other kids at school, it's going to be the arched window this afternoon. In fact, I, I happen to know that one of my sons used to, used to swap that information for a few sweets. <laughs> and it's going to be through the... square window. Never work with children, toys, windows, or, as Brian found out, animals. I do recall that we were doing a piece about, um, I think I was playing a king, but it necessitated a, a mouse being put on a cushion and uh, this beautiful white mouse and handed to the queen or whatever. That was the pantomime. It was very, very early days. And it was, uh, Rick Jones was going around asking questions like, oh, no, how, how do I sleep and various sort of very obscure things. And it wouldn't stay on the cushion, of course. And uh, so they gave it a little, I don't know what they drugged it with, but eventually we had, unfortunately, a dead mouse on the cushion, which is awful. No, we felt no. Awful. Yes, I, mean, I didn't drag it, and I don't know who did. But it didn't move, of course, which was a great help. And we got the shot done. Katoo is a killer if you got anywhere near it. And I once got bitten by a mouse and had to fill in a BBC accident report which was the sort of thing that you've been run over by a piece of very severe equipment, and it was cause of accident. I put down angry mouse. <laughs> I once swore on camera. I gave Katu a peanut, and it used to take them in the shell. And because they're quite long peanut shells, the double ones, you're, you're, you're well away from it, because it would peck at Katu. It didn't like the studio. It used to get tetchy at the end of the day in the studio. So gave it the nut, and it took it and threw it away, and pecked at me and missed. And I said, oh, it's dropped it. I'll give it to another one, you see. And this time, it took the peanut, threw it away, and pecked me all in the same movement. <laughs> you see? And I went, bus! <laughs> and that's what I said. I actually walked out of shot with my hand over my eyes as I'd said, bastard. An important question now, Julie. Did you ever wear dungarees? Gosh, that's an important question. Uh, yes, I did. Um, because at the time they were fashionable and the other fashion, and you know what it was like at that time, was miniskirts. You could have this miniskirt or that miniskirt. And the, the sort of things we used to get up to leaping about, it, it was, you know, there were people shouting, I can see your nickels! Oh, no! Whenever people send up play school, they always wear dungarees. Were you guilty of this? <laughs> I, <laughs> Mayor Culper, yes, I have worn dungarees. <laughs> I've also worn those terrible tank tops. <laughs> awful tank tops, which are now suddenly coming back into fashion. I was known as Mr. Tank Top in those days. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm guilty. There were some strange combinations of clothes, I must say. I mean, I was in these awful flares with great sideburns and <laughs> wide collars on, the, on my shirt. There are some wonderful pictures of it all. Beyond the dungarees, between the Teds and behind Katu's cage, there was a very different side to play school. Sometimes they were naive. There was a, a, a song called Bang on a Drum. They went, bang on a drum with your thumb. It's enough if you don't know how just to cool off your feet. But round with the rhythm of a drum. And I'm sure the guy who wrote that was on drugs. I'm certain he was. But I don't think the producers, ever, it ever occurred to them. They thought, what a lovely song. Yes, the kids will love that because they can all go... <laughs> <laughs> at home, you see?
one of the presenters, certainly, who left before I joined, I'm told that one of the reasons that they asked him to go was that some of his druggy mates kept sending joints through the post. I don't know if this is true at all. Certainly no, nobody ever sent me one. I know one or two of the presenters did experiment with substances uh, in the very early days. They were around. It was, it was that era. Uh, but I did not want to know, um, because, you're, you, you know, you're dealing with children. Now, I, I know that Play School was sold to other countries, and some countries sort of bought um, a kit so they could do their, their own Play Schools, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. And we'd send them the toys and, um, as part of the kit and the scripts and various the props and the, on the old studio designs the drawings for the studio design. I mean, they got rid of Hamble straight away. Uh, Hamble was our tart with a heart. The awful doll was a mucky knickers. <laughs> and, uh, so they, everybody dropped her, all the foreigners. Well, nobody would take a Hamble. Poor Hamble was fast building up a bad reputation, but even she couldn't put the audiences off until competition arrived. Throughout the 70s, we were getting a regular 5 million viewers. Now, that's a lot. And... In the early 80s, ITV suddenly started taking children's programmes much more seriously. And, of course, that meant that BBC was going to lose part of its audience. So, at that stage, they decided that Play School ought to start appealing to six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. The feeling was that the programme was, being, was getting tired, that there was not the stimulation amongst the production team and the, and the presenters and the musicians and so on that there had been, because, well, you know, a format that gets too tied up with itself you know everybody gets stuck in it stuck in the old routine sort of thing so they decided to bring it up to date which was quite a brave thing to do but i think it was necessary they decided to change everything they changed the opening titles they got rid of the the toys they got rid of the um the animals the pets uh they got rid of some of us old timers presenters and featured the, the, the younger ones coming in. They started featuring stilt walkers and jugglers, and it became, it became a kind of an everyday play away. But of course, what happened was that program was still going out at 10 o'clock or half past 10 in the morning for three-year-olds, and there was this wacky, zany program, the same program going out for eight-year-olds in the afternoon. You can't do that. It's not fair. I eventually, after 18 years... I was told that uh, I wasn't required anymore because I was too old. Um, and I wasn't that old then. And my immediate reaction was that children anyway very often go to their grandparents for stories and for chat. That They're the people who bring them the magic that the parents haven't got time to do. And so I thought it was a bit silly, but there you are, that, that happened and I was out. There were a few people who, who fell by the wayside and, and not altogether, I feel, kindly. There were people who did care and who had given a, a great deal of thought and time and care and done their very best for this programme. More than just saying, well, this is the contract and this is the money. I mean, it, 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 dedicated is, is a bit of a powerful word, really, but I think a lot of people did feel that. A few years later, they then tried to pull play school back to what it had been. They suddenly brought back the toys. Suddenly the phone started ringing again. Fred, will you come in and, and do some extra work? But it, we'd, we'd lost a lot of friends, I think, in the meantime. The show was unable to capture the magic of the early years and was eventually replaced by play days, much to the sadness of the old presenters. I have been in grief since I was no longer invited to come out and do it. I, I adored it. Now I've got grandchildren. Where is it? I mean, where is play school now? I thought it was terrible. But I, I felt sad with the BBC then because uh, the golden age is over. I know that an episode of Play School has been buried in a time capsule. What do you reckon those distant generations will make of yourself and Jemima and Big Ted and the dungarees? Uh, probably they'll look at it the same way as we look through those um, seaside machines where you turn a handle and see these bits of paper flicking around. <laughs> It'll be so way out and obscure that they'll just take it as a passing bit of rubbish from the past. Although they might they might still th wish that they'd lived 2,000 years ago. I'm a clock on the wall looking down on you all and I'm talking tick-tock talk. There's nobody who sounds like I do when I'm talking tick-tock talk. And there's a handle on the door and a carpet on the floor but they never make a sound like me. 
So here I stay, passing time away, talking TikTok talk. Why do you think it does enjoy this, this cult status? Because I think it treated small children like they had a brain, like they had opinions, like they had fears and wants and sense of humour. And children need to, to communicate, the need to have you say, have you ever been on a train? Have you? It's time for us to go. Till it's our turn to be here again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, like all things that develop into cults, nobody at that time has any notion that that will happen. But I think it must be based on the fact that it brought something to the young people of that time that nothing else was bringing. They were with it long enough to absorb it, and it's still with them. And one particular huge guy lunged up to me in a, when I was filling my car with petrol, and I thought, hello, what's going to happen here? And he came up to me and he said, thank you for my childhood which was wonderful. I, I mean, that is the sort of effect that that programme had, I think. And even if the mice will never squeak again, Fred Harris's tank tops will remain in his wardrobe and the play school clock has stopped ticking forever. A whole generation still wish to go through the arched window and will always remember with affection that wretched doll. I did a terrible thing to Hamble. I have to confess it now. Well, you know, well, I wasn't knocking it. She was quite a good performer in her way. But she just would not sit up. She would not sit up. And so you'd be saying, now, let's count the toys. And, oh, <laughs> look, Hamble's fallen down. And I'm thinking, I will tear her head off in a minute. I really will. So one day I got a very big knitting needle, a, a big wooden one, and I stuck it right up her bum and as far as her head. <laughs> so she was completely rigid, and she was much <laughs> Through the Arched Window was presented by Maggie Philbin and the producer was Laura Druce.